From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South. I am Doris Polo. We begin in Brazil, where the Supreme Court has voted 6-5 to five to end the mandatory imprisonment of alleged criminals after they lose a first appeal, restoring a previous rule that allowed the exhaustion of all appeal processes before being locked up. The ruling could lead to the release of former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Thousands of people took to the streets across the country to celebrate the court ruling. Wicca's party president, Blaise C. Hoffman, addressed multitudes of supporters outside the federal police headquarters in Curitiba, where Lula remains in prison. Today, the Supreme Court strengthened democracy and the Constitution with that decision, especially in a moment when we have a far-right government attacking the democracy and the Constitution. We have more on this from our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Mir. In Brazil, the Brazilian Supreme Court just made a historic ruling upholding the 1988 Constitution, which states that all citizens are innocent until proven guilty. And what this means is that defendants cannot be thrown in jail until they've exercised all of their rights to appeal. Last year, the Supreme Court made an exception to this rule to enable them to imprison Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, the former president who was leading in all of the election polls. And at the time, the military was threatening the courts. General Vilas Boas made a threat that was read over Journal Nacional, Global Television's most popular news program against the Supreme Court. But now they've mustered up the courage to uphold the Constitution. This has direct ramifications on Lula's case. The next steps now are that the court is going to publish its decision, then Lula's defense lawyers will file for his immediate release, and the judge has to sign off on it. If a judge tries to block it in any way, it's important to note that there's no longer any legal justification for that to happen. So even though Lula's imprisonment was very legally dubious from the get-go. There's no reason whatsoever, there's no legal justification whatsoever for him to remain in prison now after this historic court ruling. And the real hero, I think, in this is Supreme Court Justice Rosa Weber. Now, she was visibly nervous last year when she decided to side with the majority against uh, giving Lula the right to wait his appeals process out in freedom. And uh, it happened the day after the, the general threatened the court justice ministers on TV, and it looked like she was scared. This time around in her decision, she cited Angela Davis, and she reversed her decision from last April, and that was the tie-breaking vote. And you can hear they're blowing off fireworks now in my neighborhood on the periphery of Sao Paulo, celebrating what appears to be Lula's imminent release. That was our correspondent, Brian Meir, with that report. In Bolivia, violent opposition protests rocked La Paz for a third day near the government palace and the presidential house. As part of an ongoing coup attempt, violent opposition groups responding to the call of opposition leader Luis Fernando Camacho mobilized in Murillo Square, where they were stopped by fences. Security forces who are protecting the area maintained control of the situation. However, four people were injured by the protesters, who also damaged infrastructure in the sector. Pro-government demonstrators gathered outside Congress in response to acts of violence and racism by opposition sectors. Women demanded justice after the town hall in Binto was burned down and movement towards socialism mayor Patricia Arce was violently attacked. Protesters cut her hair and threw red paint at her. I stand with the truth and I am not afraid of speaking it. I am in a free country and if you want to kill me for this process of change, then I am ready to give my life. The Vice President of Bolivia, Alvaro Garcia Linera, addressed the kidnapping of the mayor in a news conference on Tuesday. People being a woman is a crime. For these people being humble is a crime. For these people to wear the traditional indigenous skirt is a crime. This doesn't happen in a democracy. This is called fascism. That is fascism. Attacking women, attacking them for being indigenous, humiliating them, attacking social organizations. That's fascism. What Bolivia is facing now is a wave of fascism. 
fascista. The 28th plenary session of the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to reject the economic, financial and commercial blockade on Cuba. Tuesday's resolution passed with 187 in favor, three against and two abstentions. The United States, Israel and Brazil voted against, Colombia and Ukraine abstained. The resolution condemned the United States' application of the helms burden Act on Cuba. It expressed the need to respect the sovereignty of states and supported non-interventionist policies as laid down in the United Nations Charter. The Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez closed the debate with a detailed account of the impact of almost six decades of a blockade on Cuba and the world. He began by condemning the United States government's recent tightening of these illegal measures. During the last few months, President Donald Trump's administration has started to escalate aggression against Cuba through the implementation of non-conventional measures to prevent the arrival of fuel shipments to our country from different markets by resorting to sanctions and threats against vessels, shipping companies and insurance companies. The intent, apart from damaging Cuba's economy, is to harm the living standards of Cuban families. The United States government is responsible uh, for announcing its decision in April this year to allow lawsuits to be filed before U.S. courts against Cuban and foreign entities under Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. Persecution of our banking and financial relations with the rest of the world has continued to intensify. Remittances sent to Cuban citizens have been restricted. The granting of visas has been reduced. Consular services have been limited. The agreement achieved between the best ball federations of both countries has been cancelled. Individual travel by American citizens has been stopped. Cruise ships travels as well as direct flights to Cuban airports, except for Havana's airport, were prohibited. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Areaza was one of the first to speak at the session. He implored the United Nations to act in order to protect its own charter, quoting Cuban poet Jose Marti saying that actions are better than words. We call for specific action to put an end to these inhumane policies which trample on the very spirit and body of the Charter of the United Nations, which are an aggression and affront to the United Nations. Uh, so that this organization can achieve its noble goals, as Jose Marti said, action is better than words. Now we must act. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is a responsible member of the international community and we will vote once again in support of Resolution A74L6 on the necessity to end the blockade against Cuba and we call on the United States once the resolution has been adopted to comply with the provisions of this resolution and the undeniable principles as proved by the General Assembly. After the break, we'll hear from anti-government protests in Chile as Dockers threaten an international boycott of Chilean ships. Stay with us. A review of the world news that investigates, incites analysis and induces criticism, because every event has a context. Pusimos el punto en el. Dot in the eye. Saturdays. Only on Telesur.
Welcome back. We move to Latin America now, where complaints of political persecution by the state against citizens, indigenous leaders and opposition politicians are increasing in Ecuador. This comes after October's massive popular protests against the government of Lenin Moreno. Let's take a look. The Pichincha Provincial Court ordered the preventive detention of one of the main leaders of the Citizen Revolution Party, Virgilio Hernández. He's been accused of the alleged crime of rebellion during the national strike. The prosecutor's office says that the evidence presented, which includes phone conversations, cash, and flags of a number of social movements, is enough proof against Hernández. They are looking for vengeance. They want to silence us for being the opposition. That's why we come here with our strength, with conviction, knowing full well we are innocent and we are being persecuted for being the opposition. Indigenous leaders have denounced they're being persecuted as well. Leonidas Issa, the president of Cotopaxi's indigenous and campesino movement and one of the main figures from October's protest, has said he's being accused of the alleged kidnapping of police officers inside Quito's main cultural center. They had not handed over the body of our brother Innocencio Tucumbi. The police officers were not kidnapped. We just wanted them to see what the government had been doing to us. They are trying to use anything against us to intimidate us. For his part, the president of the Quechua People's Confederation of Ecuador, Equarunari, rejected the role of the government during the protest. When the people reacted in this way and took to the streets out of necessity, that is when the government started violating human rights. On top of the persecution, there's a case known as the Nine from Sucumbios. It involves the detention of nine people in the Amazonian province of Sucumbios, including three lawmakers and the prefect, for allegedly stopping public services in a water pumping station. These are good people. We know they have no criminal precedents. They haven't done anything illegal. They are just like any other protesters who marched to oppose Decree 883. Over the next few days, international bodies that have been looking into the human rights violations committed during October's protest will provide a report on their findings. Chile's major trade unions are calling for a general strike next Tuesday, November 12th. As protests continue in the capital and other cities, leaders of the dockers, shop workers and miners unions, all members of the Cut Federation, criticized the human rights violations committed by the forces of repression, propping up the government of Sebastian Piñera. It's going to be an historic day. The solidarity between workers is clear. We've been together mobilizing, and we have to come together as a society, beyond just as workers. We call on everyone to join us. Together we can work for the changes that the country needs. We are an organization that counts on more than 40,000 members and more than 100 unions. We are with the Kurd Federation. Unity is important to us above all. We call on the commercial sector and financial services not to wake that day. We want to be clear that any talks, with whomever they may be, must stem from a basic respect for human rights. Human rights continue to be trampled on. Our kids are being shot while at school. This is something that needs to be addressed through a commission of justice and truth. We need to take control of the situation in the country. With respect to what we've spoken about and what we're in agreement on, a constituent assembly being called for by the people is a call coming from our communities, from our homes. And the International Dock Workers Council has energetically rejected the repression of protests in Chile. The organization published a letter saying that the Chile Dock Workers Union forms an integral part of 125,000 members strong organization. The communique highlights the injury to colleagues threatening an international boycott of all cargo coming from Chile if repression doesn't end. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, commended the fight of the Chilean people against neoliberalism promoted by the government of Sebastian Piñera. Our sister nation, Chile, rebellious Chile. Chile does not stop. It's very impressive. And thankfully, we have social networks where we can find out about what's happening because we only had CNN. Nobody will know anything. But thankfully, we have social networks and we have Telesur. 
so we can witness the rebellious need of the youth, of women, of workers, of all Chile, even of children. Chile has said enough, and they will not stop until they achieve their goal. Chile's writing history will not forget 2019 has been the year of awakening for Chile. All of Latin America and the Caribbean will wake up. Long live Chile. In the Caribbean, Guyana's government remains in interim mode until the March 2nd, 2020 general elections are held. This follows last December's no confidence motion, which determined to have been validly passed. President David Granger shows that the government continues to adhere to the convention of a caretaker administration. We have accepted that we are an interim administration. I, for one, apart from my health, I have not traveled to any international conferences you know, for over a year. And, um, and we have not entered into any major agreements. Now, since it came to office in 2015, Guyana's government has provided Christmas bonuses to public workers. But this year, there is no guarantee, as the president is awaiting advice on whether the funds are available to make the much-anticipated tax-free payout. I'm not saying no, but um, after the next cabinet meeting, the Minister of Finance will be able to make uh, an announcement on that matter. In Barbados, the way seems clear for the Mia Motley administration to draw down its third installment of 50 million US dollars under a 300 million dollar IMF loan. The money is intended to finance the island's economic recovery and transformation program. Two days ago, we launched the external debt exchange, and that is expected to close um, by the end of this month. And I think that our ability to put behind us the debt restructuring exercise completely allows us to move fully into the next stage of the program, which is literally to complete the structural changes that we have in our regulatory structure to make it easier, not just to do business, but for Barbadians to enjoy services that are delivered to them on a daily basis. And then secondly, for us to focus completely on the projects that are necessary to be able to really do the transformation, um, be it the transformation of our people through the continuous training and the national training initiative over the next four years, or the physical infrastructural projects that are absolutely critical. Harvard University has responded to Antigua and Barbuda Prime Minister Gaston Brown's call for reparations. The U.S.-based law school was built due to the contributions of an Antiguan slave owner. Prime Minister Brown had written to Harvard's president, Tell Lawrence Bacow, asking for a meeting to discuss his request for Harvard to finance Antigua's public university campus. This, as Brown reminded, that slave labor had paid for the prestigious institution. In a response published in the Harvard Crimson, the university's student newspaper, Bacow says while Harvard acknowledges its role in slavery, it recognizes the need for additional work to be done. The university's president, however, failed to directly answer the Antiguan leader's reparations no request. We're taking one last break. When we come back, several Nigerian soldiers were killed in an ambush on Thursday. Don't move. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that transcend. Moments that you can live in. Telezur documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telezur.
Welcome back. In Africa, Benin has implemented a new constitution aimed at calming political tensions that have shook up the country for the past six months. Changes to the electoral law are among the reforms, as well as amnesty for offenses that took place during the post-election unrest. The points of innovation revising the constitution concern the abolition of the death penalty, the instituting of general elections with the alignment of all elected mandates, the setting of first general elections in 2026, the public financing of political parties and the naming of an opposition leader. At least 10 soldiers have been killed in northeast Nigeria following an ambush. Another nine were seriously wounded while 12 remain missing. The attack targeted troops on patrol in Borno State, an area where Boko Haram militants have been active. However, the rival militant group Amak, loyal to the Islamic State, has claimed responsibility, but the Nigerian military maintains that Boko Haram was behind the attack. First went with soldiers in Uchima area from an attack. Upon arrival, they were ambushed by Boko Haram terrorists. Thank God we have succeeded, but they also attack us and kill some of our security men, because up until now, I have not seen two of my members. In Burkina Faso, the relatives of 38 people who were killed in an attack on a mining company convoy say they have been left angry and distraught as they demand for an official list of the dead and of survivors. Five buses carrying staff from the Canadian firm Semafo were ambushed on Wednesday. A military escort vehicle was reportedly struck by an explosive device before gunmen opened fire on the convoy. Sixty people were injured while several others remain missing. This was reportedly the third deadliest attack on Semafo staff in just the past 15 months. No one has claimed responsibility as of yet. I haven't seen my husband for two days. I came here today to see his body and take it. What the ministers are saying, that doesn't work for me. It won't bring back the dead. We need our parents' bodies to bury them in dignity. That is all we're asking for. People call you and say, we told you he's dead. Have you seen him? What confirmation do you have that he's really dead? Imagine the stress that we are living through. None of us have had any sleep. Thousands of students continue to protest in front of the Ministry of Education in Beirut as demonstrations are entering their fourth week. The peaceful strike saw students armed with banners as they waved flags, sang, and set off colored smoke. They say they are graduating without job opportunities and are demanding a better future. Anti-government protests are increasingly targeting state institutions as the country calls for a regime change. As the students came out today because none of us want to get diplomas without being able to get a job. Lebanon's youth is migrating in search of work because there are no jobs in our country. Staying in Lebanon, the country's state prosecutor has questioned former Prime Minister Fouad Zinyora on how $11 billion in state funds was spent during his tenure. In a statement, Zinyora claimed that the money was used legally, adding that it was used to meet state needs. This is the first time a former Prime Minister has been summoned to court for corruption. We are protesting in front of Signora's office because of the 11 billion that was misused during his term. Today, the financial prosecutor summoned him and he left as if he didn't spend those 11 billion. We condemn this and we will continue to stay in the streets until we topple every corrupt person in the Lebanese state. The show of simply summoning him is not enough. We want the money, we want our children's money, and we will not leave the streets until we get back our money. And we end with news on the global economy as the United States and China reached an agreement to end the commercial war between the two countries. Our partner Imramzi Peraza extends the details. The Chinese government announced on Thursday that it has reacted an agreement with the United States to progressively pause out additional tariffs that both nations have been applying on each other as part of trade war over that past year. A spokesman for the Chinese Minister of Commerce that trade negotiators reacted an agreement and hope to react a final agreement to end this trade conflict. He also said that this elimination of tariffs must be done simultaneously and in the same proportions.
So far, there is no confirmation that the United States has unknowledged this agreement with China. However, this is already one of the most important pacts reacting negotiation between the two nations. Previously, the two nations acted a limited agreement during a 13th round of trade negotiations in October. According to U.S. President Donald Trump, that agreement represents a principle of understanding to react an eventual greater consensus. The agreement covered the base of intellectual property, financial service, and the exchange rate. Beijing and Washington also made commits to cancel an increase by $250 billion of tariff on Chinese products in October and to make agricultural purchase in the U.S. market for $50 billion. En octubre, el mes pasado, en Washington, y este acuerdo, el cual puso una pausa a una... That was our correspondent, Iramzi Peraza, with that report, bringing us to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.